I'd like to thank Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The ancient Greeks and Romans, for example, did not think that mountains were beautiful. Fertile plains and gentle coasts where civilization flourished were beautiful. But mountains were obstacles, wastelands, the dens of wild beasts. Only a few eccentrics, like the Emperor Hadrian, seem to have had any appreciation of alpine scenery. We cannot, in other words, assume that the Greeks and Romans understood beauty in the same way we do, especially in the case of something as culturally constructed as female beauty. Beyond a few signs of basic health, such as symmetrical features, standards of female beauty have always varied both between and within societies. The evidence for what was considered beautiful in the classical world is far from straightforward. Let's start with Helen of Troy. Homer's descriptions of women and goddesses are quite literally formulaic. The Iliad emerged from a long tradition of oral poetry in which characters are associated with stock epithets. The goddess Dawn is always rosy-fingered, and Achilles can be described as swift-footed even when he's brooding in his tent. The epithets used to describe Helen include fair-haired, fair-cheeked, and white-armed. An aristocratic lady, who never had to work outside, was expected to be pale, and naturally fair hair was always unusual in Greece. But since other women received the same epithets, we aren't left with a clear picture of what Homer's audience considered beautiful. Roman literature is also elusive. To take the most explicit example, in the third book of his Art of Love, which pretends to provide women with a guide for romantic success, Ovid lists various methods for disguising thin legs and flat chests. In another work, he describes facial treatments for whitening skin. These provide clues about what Ovid's readers found attractive, but they hardly amount to an ideal. Artistic evidence is more straightforward. The red figure pottery of classical Athens often depicts the courtesans known as hetairai in the wine-soaked setting of the symposium. Though sometimes represented in artfully draped tunics, hetairai also appear as voluptuous nudes, perhaps the ancient equivalent of pinup posters. The most influential representation of female beauty in Greek art, however, was the Aphrodite of Knidos, sculpted by Praxiteles in the mid-4th century BC. This first life-size female nude in classical sculpture showed the goddess preparing for her bath. Her youthful and full-figured body was modeled by the famous Athenian courtesan Phryne. The Aphrodite was an immediate sensation and would be copied and imitated for the next half-millennium. Even now, museums are filled with variations. The Capitoline Venus, the Crouching Venus, the Venus Calipige, Another version, Venus Victrix, appeared on Roman coins. The original statue became a famous tourist attraction, complete with merchants selling souvenir erotic vases. Pompeian frescoes provide the best context for exploring female beauty in Roman art. In the mythological scenes, often inspired by lost Greek masterpieces that make up such a large part of the Pompeian corpus, beautiful women are featured prominently. Notable examples include Ariadne from the House of the Great Altar, Andromeda from the House of the Priest Amandus, and Venus from the aptly named House of Venus and Mars. Pompey's erotic frescoes present a less mannered exploration of female beauty. Though often found in the bedrooms of aristocratic mansions, such as the House of the Vetii, the most extensive series appear in these suburban baths, in the infamous Lupinar, the best known of the city's brothels. The women of the erotic frescoes have broad hips, small breasts, and pale skin. So, for the most part, do the women in mythological frescoes. To some extent, these features are artistic conventions. This is just how Pompey's artists tended to paint women. But it's reasonable to assume that the conventions reflect what was considered attractive. The Aphrodite of Knidos, after all, was the paragon of female beauty. A dialogue attributed to Lucian effuses about the loveliness of the statue's legs and hips, and claims that a certain young man, in an ecstasy of admiration, made love to the cold marble. We should not, however, 
assume that the frescoes of Pompeii, or any other work of art, can serve as an unambiguous guide to ancient ideas of female beauty. We don't have to deconstruct everything. The hairstyles of portrait statues, for example, are probably accurate representations of what was fashionable, but we should be wary of trying to impose neat definitions. For the Greeks and Romans, as for any historical culture, human beauty was never simple. The physical attributes of beauty, like pale skin, were always implicitly associated with cultural values and social norms. In the frescoes of Pompeii, both goddesses and prostitutes are pale, and both were meant to be beautiful. But to an ancient viewer, their beauty had different connotations, signaling divine perfection in one case, and very human desirability in the other. Beauty, in other words, is not only skin deep, it is also, in more ways than one, a fantasy. You know what isn't a fantasy? Delicious coffee delivered right to your door, courtesy of today's sponsor, Trade. Trade is a subscription service that sends you coffee when and how you want it. Their algorithm sorts through hundreds of coffee flavor profiles to find the blend best suited to your preferences. Once you've selected a blend produced by one of the more than 55 local roasters Trade works with, the coffee is sent to your home. My first bag was a blend from Cafe Ladro in Seattle. It was just what I wanted, smooth and rich, with a hint of caramel. I'm looking forward to my next bag. Visit drinktrade.com slash toldenstone or click the link in the description to sign up and save $15 on select plans and get your first bag of coffee free. My new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines, is now available as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can buy your copy through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. For more Toldenstone content, check out my channels, Toldenstone Footnotes, and Scenic Roots to the Past, which are linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Tolden Stone on Patreon. Thanks for watching.